role um, is head of talent development. As with most job descriptions, it probably doesn't quite cover what I actually do. But um, so I would work for Sport England. And uh, for those of you, I don't want to presume you know how it works in the system here, but uh, you would have UK Sport, which typically look after the kind of Olympic and Paralympic programs. So kind of the senior um, kind of uh, yeah, the more senior programs, if you like, orientated to that. Um, so Sport England then is one of the home nations. So again, it's quite important because we always have to work in, in factors of five, if you like, with UK Sport, uh, Sport England, Sport Wales, Sport Scotland, Sport Northern Ireland. And we also have the English Institute of Sport, which is really like the UK Institute of Sport anyway. So more is to the point, there's kind of a whole group in the system. Um, and my role within Sport England is around talent development. So Sport England itself has a really wide breadth of responsibility over sport and physical acti activity within England primarily. Um, though clearly about 80% of the athletes who will go on to kind of senior Olympic Paralympic teams are typically English. Um, and the role I have, I suppose, is it, and Sporting that has always been, it's, it's a, probably a bit like Sport Ireland in the sense around um, funding and investment in programmes. And also, again, kind of a lot of, I suppose, kind of try to, to lead in terms of ensuring that um, physical activity uh, reaches all parts of the island and all parts of the of people that are engaged with it so i'll i'm sure we'll talk on around some of this stuff around inclusion and trying to inspire a lot of um increase activity etc yeah. all those kind of elements but the current role i have is particularly in the talent um sphere we can talk around what we mean by talent in a moment um and i guess there's two prongs to it firstly is a bit around the investment side so i would kind of manage we we support um 44 different pathways so that's 44 different ngbs so everything from women's and girls football with the fa through to uh waterboarding and wakeboarding um wrestling and kind of everything in the in between so it's fascinating there's a really fascinating range of sports uh, one of the things i really love about the role is you just get a breath as we haven't spent so many years in rowing you just see oh wow there's a whole other world out there which is great so yeah so we manage a lot of the investments so we would so every kind of four years sports would apply for funding uh we would kind of work through the process with them and then you'd like manage the investment which is quite a mercenary way of describing it's not quite that but uh, that's to kind of keep an eye on the public first, but also to understand what's going on. And the other half of the role, I suppose, draws on my background experience, a bit of a coach and a scientist. Um, and it's around really, I suppose, I do a lot of commissioning of research and insight and trying to develop the strategy around what do we mean around how we develop talent in England? Where are we trying to go with it? How do we support senior programs? Um, and, and the whole kind of philosophy and approach around how we do that from a system perspective. So it's kind of less about the individual athlete, um, probably less about the coaches and the people around them, but a little bit more around how you support the program and what they need to do to underpin and the kind of the process of development. So we're trying to understand a little bit of how best you do that. Um, and therefore, how do you put it into play in kind of a, I won't say structured, but probably a more formalized way. Um, but it has to be applicable to that number of yeah of sports, so, the, right? it's, so it's quite high level but yeah so yeah. Clear, we would work a lot of principles if you like um, yeah. and indeed we kind of have launched a set of principles around what we believe around developing young people um i hesitate to use the word talent because it has so many connotations but it's it's we almost have to use it to differentiate it from participation for example so okay again happy to discuss that <laughs> yeah yeah that is uh, <laughs> yes. that's up for debate um no that uh, sounds fascinating role um i love the idea of getting to work across uh so many sports i think it's quite um, cool, I have to say. and it and it brings obviously then a lot of learnings probably to your time from when you were rowing of how other sports are doing it now yeah. what could have been done differently um in your time in rowing so no it's really really interesting um so you started i think you came from the jazz and you rode and then you rode also with nuig um yeah. But how did you get involved in coaching? Um, maybe there was, was there a person particularly that encouraged you to move into coaching or was it the environment or, you know, what made you make that first step and not just go down your, your career path of um, engineering? Yeah, I think, yeah, I started life as an engineer. Uh, yeah, really good question. I was trying to remember this, actually, what got me in. Um, I think I was asked is the simple thing. Um, and um, yeah, I think I remember it was, it wasn't even immediate. I remember I so I'd kind of rode at the jazz and then rode at UCG and, and done all that and then had got a job 
and I think actually it was probably half, it was kind of six or eight months out after university and then heard someone had got sick or someone couldn't do it. And anyways, um, I remember being invited into the Jazz and I think I had a group of like three junior 15s, a junior 16 and a junior 14, something kind of random like that. And I think I also recollect that my brother was also started coaching with me at the time, actually. Um, so, yeah, I just got kind of hooked in on that. I think because we'd all come through the Jazz, it was just part of it. And But I suppose the real driver, actually, and it still is really, was to give back to to based on what the amazing experiences I had and like the friends I'd made and the whole just kind of life experience. Um, yeah, I just, I was like, just how amazing would it be to be able to support other people to do that um, and yeah. give, give something to that. So yeah, I think that's how it happened. I do also remember I had really good support around me um, again. Um, and also, I suppose it's interesting, I suppose we talked just on the women in sport, it was actually I'd been coached by female coaches um with uh so i remember fiona lawless and Hel helen patching at coaches to junior championships so in one sense i never thought that i couldn't why wouldn't i um yeah. and it was actually so ever really was for a thing around for me of, of why wouldn't i i suppose was more the case um yeah so and why was, those coaches passed pupils of yeah the they were so it's kind and of also they, was the right time. yeah and it was i remember we were kind of just the first or the second generation on from so that first group of girls in the jazz at all at all um i think was only like Make, I mean, it seems like ages when you were kind of 15 or 16, but they were probably only like 19 or 20 now that I think. But, yeah. um, but it was like we'd had a bit of heritage and there was a real momentum around it. Um, and we yeah. went on to continue. But again, there was real support. I suppose it's only when you reflect on it, you realise, goodness, if we didn't have the likes of a Mert Curry who took us on and coached us and, um, you know, the kind of the Pat Brackens when I was there, McDara, Glynn's, like th those guys who kind of took you on and just took you for your knowledge and experience and, and kind of work from that. So, um, but yeah, many, I think it was them. How many years were you coaching there at, at the Jets? Uh, seven program? years, actually. Yeah. Years, I just yeah. seem to it, do life cycles in seven years for, for me for some reason. But, um, but yeah, so I started kind of with that group, started with my brother Neil at the time. And I think then he went to college or something and then my sister Sinead came in and we got a few more come in girls that year so we kind of made up the squad a little bit more and then it kind of worked on over that over when we built we built it, it it built over probably six or seven years really um and Sinead and I did I kind of coached as a team and again part of a wider group within the Jazz then yeah. um, and, and you yeah, built a really strong women's program I that was the time when I was junior trying yeah again. that's right actually. Down, the camps were even held in Jazz and yeah basically yeah. couldn't get anywhere else <laughs> they'd let us use their boats probably but anyways so <laughs> I, I, I I guess yeah I like do you feel like you progressed that program on a lot from when you started? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I, you know, I don't even really, I, I just remember being, um, I remember just enjoying it so much and remember um, I was learning so much and I was so curious to see how we could build the group. And like, we kind of got me further. And again, also, I suppose we had like tribesmen and going at the time as well. And we were kind of like, clipping off them a lot and go away wrong clubs. So actually it was quite a good cohort in go anyways. You're kind of looking across the river seeing what was going on and that drove me on a little bit. But also really the energy from the crew themselves, they just wanted more. So it was a bit like, oh goodness, I'm gonna to have to learn a bit more and learn a bit quicker. Um, how do I stay ahead and support them? So yeah, I remember we did so yeah, I get it was it was really just and, and also I think massively learned because in one sense I could never understand like what was the appeal of coaching and then I remember I literally it was the days it was even before internet uh where I remember I think I had to get a self address a, a stamp address envelope and go to the post office to get a sterling bank draft and write to like you uh, sports coach UK or whatever it was at the time for a coaching book <laughs> I was oh, like, wow. and um I remember reading something in that which massively stuck with me and I think again really inspired me was around um Good, uh, good coaches coach the person. Um, sport is a medium through which they perform. And I, I kind of read it and thought, and then I just remember, I still remember to this day, exactly where I was on the riverbank and exactly who I was coaching. And that kind of phrase went back into my head again. And I was like, I'm not trying to teach her to tap down in a way. I'm trying to teach Sive to do that. So what do I need to address about Sive? And then suddenly it was like, oh, it's about the crew. It's about the people. They're just using rowing. So yeah, and you get that buzz. Yeah, it, right, and, and did and the ups and the downs and the tears and the laughter and but also the whole kind of club going around it and that real community spirit again almost just seemed normal and natural but I get and it's only often as you step back and when I realized when there was parts of my career when I didn't have that actually how important it was 
Um, so yeah, so again, yeah, just it's always the I energy it's, for me. It's what I miss it's, now actually about not coaching is, yeah. is that energy of young people. <laughs> I think as well though, uh, like I, you would think, why would you coach? And it's you need to be able to convey that to the athletes as well, that enjoyment mm -hmm. or. So in the hope that they will see this as, oh, it's, it's still fun when you're off the water and you're the one um, in the launch and you're the one coaching. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe you don't really fully realize it when you're at the time. No, um, no. But then the opportunity came up anyway to, to take on coaching as a professional career. Um, so at the time you were working as an engineer, well, what gave you kind of the leap of faith? Or, the confidence to take that leap of faith and move into <laughs> I don't know about the confidence. Coaching. I think taking the leap of faith was the confidence to do it. Um, yeah, really good question. So as I'd, um, do you know, and again, it was a little bit dependent on my own experience as junior. Um, I didn't have some great experiences when I went to trials. And I do remember certain coaches telling a whole bunch of junior women that they were too fat and things like that. And I was like, that's not great. And I'd have distinct remembers of coming home, coming into the sitting room after training camps and just bawling my eyes out because I had such a bad time. <laughs> And that was kind of like, but yeah, actually it led to some really great experiences. But I remember just thinking, I was like, oh my God, if I'm putting some of, some of the athletes I've been coaching at the time, it got to a point where they were getting good enough to the kind of trials. I just thought I can't, I can't just put them into a scenario like that without, you know, making sure they're going to be okay and understanding what's going on. And of course, one thing led to another and then I found myself volunteering to be like junior women's convener and stuff and being hooked into it but I guess also like I, I really enjoyed high, like I suppose what you class as high performance rowing now but it was just like going faster and I yeah. loved going to international competitions I loved to see all the flags and hear the accents and the different colors and even just going to regattas like you know you go down to like O'Brien's Bridge and look over the kind of hill and see all the boat trailers in there and um, yeah. Just I, I loved all that element, and I think you know being started to be part of of the Rowing Ireland group, um, and kind of people going to trials and stuff with the athletes that just led to that, and also it was at the time when um, Harold Jarling and Debbie Fox were coaching in Ireland, um, and it, it was kind of yeah I guess it, it was just a combination of things. One I suppose they it was at the time also in Ireland when you know the country could afford to have apprentice coaches and had a notion around trying to develop homegrown coaches if you like yeah. so actually an apprenticeship uh, a coaching apprenticeship role came up and um, I was also I suppose a period in my life I was in my late 20s a bit foot, footloose fancy free if you like and kind of itching to have a bit of an adventure so it was very carpe yeah. diem so I kind of ditched the old permanent pensionable engineering job and and just I decided like I just gotta go for it these opportunities don't come around too much in life and I just thought yeah. you know I'm just gonna do it um, and yeah. so it kind was, of very relatable uh, yeah well yeah. our yeah. own perfect role model um oh, no. but yeah it was it was a real uh, jump we, and I do you think at the time you looked to other um opportunities in rowing and like did you really assess the situation and say well will i be able to get a page coaching university job like did you feel like there were going to be other opportunities after this no, I really didn't know. And at that time, there was none of that in Ireland at all, at all. I was the first, I think I was the first paid coaching role outside a head coach in Ireland. And I actually, in one sense, I probably made it a bit harder because I took it massively seriously and a huge privilege. Um, uh, but yeah, I thought, and I probably, yeah. And it was a new role. It was kind of a different, so part of the apprenticeship, if you like, was learnt. So I sat in the launch literally with Harold, like hours yeah. and hours of sessions and he'd be like, you know, raise this arm and this. And I'm like, I can't see what he's talking about. <laughs> so it would take years of experience to notice like raising this or that or turning that finger in that way. So very kind of niche. Um, yeah. But then also more to the point, this was I had the opportunity to practice of um, creating and building a junior performance structure. So that really was invaluable actually now that I think of it again, even in my yeah. current role. It's always that kind of at look, it's like the athlete, the coach unit, but then how you support that and how you support that, if you like. And um, so I guess I suppose that's where I'm, I'm still sitting around that. But um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it, I did I did learn a lot, it was, but there was definitely, um, definitely and, jumping and into the edge. But no, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just thought, well, let's go for it and see. Um, yeah, I remember my 30th birthday hanging off a tree in Inascara trying to time the end of a time trial and I was just thinking oh this is interesting it's not where I thought I'd be when I was 30 but I yeah I know I was really kind of just up for the ride I always had I could go back to engineering I think that was yeah. me so there was a bit of a safety net I didn't have a house I had a really supportive 
family um, around it. And like my brother at the time was involved in the team as well. So there was a bit of a kind of a safety net there if I needed yeah. it. Yeah, I didn't know where I was going to go. <laughs> but it is something that like, I do think there are opportunities there if you find that it's like mm -hmm. a big passion of yours. And I'm a strong believer in myself that, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out, like just follow mm -hmm. those passions and you'll make a career out of something. But anyway, um, so then from there you went on to UK. So you spent two years with Ireland and with Harold leaving, I suppose you decided to go further afield maybe for more experience. Yeah, it was really good. It was, I have to say it was really hard, really hard decision to move. Um, really hard decision to move. I think I felt I'd kind of made a big change uh, in what I did, a massive commitment to kind of learning the trade and learning a craft to high performance coach. And at the time, I think I'd heard knew Harold was going to go and I just couldn't quite see the opportunity. And I just felt I'd given two years of it. And it was actually Harold who said, look, if you want to work in a high performance system, you need, probably need to leave the country. And, and unfortunately, that was the, it was at the time that the time, yeah. seemed to be the one. It's different now, so it's fascinating to watch the evolution over the years, which has been so heartening. But um, and actually at the time, Britain had, you know, topped tables in kind of world championships. So I was like, hmm. But it, I felt it felt it was really hard, really hard for me to leave. I'd spent on such a good network. Um, I felt we'd worked really hard. There was some really good stuff taking off. Um, you know, there was a kind of an embryonic, I suppose, system there, if you like. Um, yeah. But I just kind of felt, not that I wasn't being taken seriously, but I just couldn't see the opportunity for myself to continue learning. Um, and that's probably what drove the decision. So I had seen actually then a role um, in London and I had had a few friends in London at the time, as most Irish people do. Um, and uh, it was a role with um, what was GB Rowing Team, their World Class Star Programme. So again, I kind of hadn't a clue what I was getting into. Um, so yeah, drove over uh, in my car and landed in London uh, and took, took up. <laughs> Your big leap. Um, so what for those maybe that might not be fully aware what was what is the talent id program for rowing what uh, i know um british rowing are a big believer in it it hasn't quite been a pillar here i suppose um but what what does that mean talent identification yeah really good question it's very um specific um to the sport i think and it was interesting so it was at the time um i think had they got london games within the British system. So I think effectively they were, and also interestingly, there was an influx of Australians into Britain at the time, uh, namely Peter Shakespeare as well, who actually started the World Class Star Programme, who had also done a programme similar in Australia that actually Debbie Fox and Harold Jarling had been oh. aware of. So it's funny how these things okay. work. But oh, anyways, totally. That's right. um, but yeah, so the, 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 what they were trying to do was identify talent for, to win future Olympic medals. I mean, that still is what its kind of mandate, if you like, is. Um, what they were trying to do it was, and I, it's not that I don't agree with it, but I, it's not it's not the only route. So it was because they were not getting enough heavyweight men through or heavyweight women through, what they decided to do was instead of looking through the normal talent pool, the normal pathway, if you like, and the kind of what the feed from the schools or the clubs, they would effect effectively do, and what it is is talent transfer, and try and look for people who had the attributes to become world class or high performance uh, rowers. So, and when I when we talk about talent ID, um, we talk about it in the sense of the potential to become. And um, so, it's if there's a little bit of is talent nature, is it nurture? Um, in one sense, it almost doesn't matter because actually, what you're trying to look at is really you're going to have to develop the person, uh, anyways. But it's also in terms of rowing, it's kind of starting to look, and we kind of apply this to kind of later on, I took this idea, or not took this idea, but took this experience and we've applied it to various other sports, but it's the principle of like, what are you actually trying to achieve and it working back a little bit. And then what are the key attributes that you're looking for in someone in order to win a gold medal in four years time or in eight years time? And what do we understand around rowing? So the first thing is they're tall, typically as heavyweights. Now, rowing went to like doing super tall and big and they never like it has massively refined it over the years in terms of what it's looking for so it has been an iterative process um and a lot and what they try to do then again this is why things like the environment and the club is just as important as like the characteristics it's not you haven't just picked a per, you haven't just picked tall you've picked a tall person and also yeah. you've got to think around the person around that the development environment that you're creating for them and also the attributes that you think you can develop so is is the selection process purely physical 
Like, is there uh, any testing of the mental? So that has or, come. Or that has come. Yeah. So initially, it was like if you bang your head walking under the door, you're pretty much in. Um, but um, uh, it has evolved from that massively, and I think that's the thing that it's it's almost a misnomer to say it's just about being tall because actually they've evolved it over the years. And you're right. So what they now have is a phased approach, and they also have like confirmation approaches. It's so it's almost like a job. You know, if you start, you tend to be on six months probation. So there's a little bit of try before you buy for both parties. Yeah. So in this sense, one it's always kind of and again regardless of what the sport is you're trying to look at what are this what is the thing you can't develop in the person mm -hmm. and therefore what as a program do you think you can develop in them and then looking at what headroom is there so yes it did start with height it started with strength there's still an element of that but it's now become a lot more nuanced around relative the age that you might meet that person at the yeah. training history they might have um and also they now learn a lot for example that actually if you you kind of need to win particularly as a male to win a medal at the world under 23s if you want to make it into the senior team now in britain um so therefore in order to do that you need to you can't pick someone up who's like 21 22 you've got to probably identify them when they're around 17 or 19. we also yeah. know that then therefore that now it's a bit older with women because it's not as critical but you still need to be on a trajectory and also then therefore you need like they need to be this kind of some um like physical attributes that you know that they'll have but also like if they're too light they're not going to develop enough muscle mass in order in time to be able to develop mm. this so there's a whole bunch of things in that's come in and just yeah. iterative learning over the years but fundamentally it comes down does the person want to and are they having fun like yeah. actually it's kind of ridiculous and you would think with all this science a lot of all that got lost and there was a lot of people who left and i think that's early days when they started to reflect on why are these yeah. people not staying? They could be an Olympian. Even the messages they were giving, you can be an Olympian. And a lot of people coming into the program thinking, great, I'm here, done. Pressure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and um, I, so you were working as well in basically the environment side of that is being created around these, these athletes that yeah, were identified. So yeah so my role was part of the identification process so we would like do tests and we do loads of physical assessments we would observe and again to learn your and i think i think a professional judgment has become more appreciated over the years which you have to be careful it doesn't become biased but um so that's why you kind of triangulate opinion and stuff um and also then yeah so we would um the start program was effectively there was eight centers all around the country and uh, there was a start coach at each center and that coach was responsible for maybe six to ten athletes all different age groups, all different genders. Yeah. Um, and then we would, the part of the process of development, and that's pretty much stayed this process, albeit how it's done has changed a little bit over the years, is um, yeah, there would be kind of monthly start camps and there would be a series of technical skills. Um, and I guess what worked in start, albeit there was a huge amount of learning over the years, was um, they, they taught rowing differently. They taught it A in singles. So it's a bike, kind of almost like learning to ride your bicycle without stabilizers. Um, but again, it was very much like, what are the, physical attributes, technical attributes, skill attributes that that person needs to have. And then we're not going to have them roll loads of eights. That's not going to develop them technically. So in one sense, you could see it was possibly cutting off the fun. But, you know, and then like effectively over the years, they realize again, through losing people, it's always a good way to change what you might be doing. Um, rowers vote with their feet, really. Isn't it? Um, uh, you know, they realized actually, you know, yeah. it, it does make sense to learn how to do crews. And what was happening then, early doors was you're getting a really lot of strong rowers who could scull well but just killed an eight or killed a big boat crew so you, you kind of work back you'd get that experiencing feed it in earlier and build it on but yeah so it's it's a very iterative process albeit there is some kind of key attributes that you know you can't develop in someone like height but again a lot of the program is then designed around the person try to understand them and, and also again this was another benefit of it and again that's where it's this why it's resource intensive is you might have one coached 10 athletes so you do actually get to know that person quite well they have individualized training programs written for them even from age 15 you know so there is that kind of individual attention um to them but on the as i say on the flip side uh, a lot of them were accelerated through too quick into the senior team and just broke um, yeah. either just mentally or physically because they weren't ready so there's much a longer development journey yeah. and a longer time to give the, the young people space and time um to develop now so yeah it's it's a real evolution really i think like i can see so many uh cons maybe uh, more than pros like there's definitely pros to it for sure but i think um there's no doubt that the kind of those uh, and maybe by fast tracking it you you 
like there's no doubt that GB rowing does get results, but I guess um, I think they're just like, is it the right use of resources? I guess is what I'm. Yeah, to so it's know. it's a yeah, yeah it's a, it's a really valid question. I think so. What what British rowing would acknowledge is it's a stream, and they realise that actually you can't hinge everything on talent ID. Um, you have to develop. It's also more to the point if you're putting resources into that. What resources are you putting into the rest of your program? that isn't delivering, because that's significantly more than this small pocket. So albeit Stark delivers up to about a third of the Olympic and Paralympic team. So it now does hinge off and it works off a lot of universities. But again, what we see across Britain is actually a far more focus now on trying to develop the universities, develop the high performance programs, yeah. develop their club program. So actually there, there's a lot of work gone into that now to start to kind of build it up. Because Talent ID solves problems. It, it can solve a problem quickly. And, and I suppose the thing about it is they used to think it could fast track, but actually it still takes the athletes at least four to six years to make the teams. Yeah. So um, yeah, they, they used to do that, but they, they, they wouldn't describe it as that now more. Um, I guess the, the Steve Gunn runs a program would describe the athletes who come in as high performance novices. So, you know, they've got an engine, but you've still got to teach them how to row and, and yeah. build them up so that, you know, that's the bit we did. But it, I think it, it solves a, it solves a problem. It solves a gap. Um, so you, you, it's, it's been really clear about what are you trying to do with Talent ID. Um, and also there are variations of Talent ID. One is about picking someone who's never rowed at all. But actually, even so, you know, the Helen Glovers of the world, people who go on to win Olympic medals from Talent ID, it's not like they've been sat on the couch for 10 years beforehand. Yeah. Like they're usually good athletes. And we see yeah. loads of examples like going into the unis here. You can pick you. So actually, you know, yeah. Talent yeah. is probably a bit of a misnomer sometimes. Like my talent rowing par partner, Sinead, is a perfect example. Like she won yeah. the World Championship, obviously two years, three years into rowing, but has been an amazing triathlete prior to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, for sure, I big believer that whole 10 year base, I think, it really yeah is. and actually interesting so if you actually look hard. look back at the athletes who do progress they typically have a long training history yeah. so then if we go back to maybe your own personal experience mm. um you spent five years in the kind of british rowing high performance environment um do you think that was a positive or experience um or <laughs> I would say it's a learning experience. Yeah. Um, yeah it, 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 so yeah, it it, it was. I, I learned a huge amount. Um, I think it was tough for me because I moved and I hadn't. No, I realised again I had no support network. It was really different, um, like culturally rowing in Britain is. Um, you'll have experienced this as well, Claire. I think a lot of yeah. the connotations around the, the kind of private schools and things like that as well. I mean, I, I remember going to the British Schools Regatta and I thought I'd gone into like medieval history. There was all these like different tents along the banks. Yeah. It was not, not like rowing as I know it. Um, so, uh, so it was really different. So I, it took me a long while to adjust. The club I, I went to was tough. It was a high performance, but I think there's a big confusion about performance and impersonal or impersonal, I should say. You can still be pers you can still be high performance and actually treat people well and so on and so forth. So that was tough. I missed home um, and I worked too hard. I burned out is the truth what happened. Um, I was trying to learn. I did a master's in sports science in the background as well, just for fun. Um, but, um, but I learned a huge amount. And as I say, I probably learned as much how not to do things as do things sometimes. Yeah. But I did learn um, a lot around the kind of the, the logic and the process I learned a huge amount about actual rowing like the mechanics of it and how it worked yeah. and again had some really good mentors like really met some really wonderful people and really good people um, and I guess you know just also reflecting as well it just shows the importance of the, your daily training environment um, you know one of your questions to me was did I have any reservations and I was like actually I loved coaching I love being a professional coach I would probably but the challenge of being a high performance or kind of a national level coach is there's only one show in town. So if, if, you know, if you work as an engineer, I could work for Google or Facebook mm -hmm. or Norton yeah, yeah. if I didn't like the environment, but you don't really have that choice when you have a, yeah. a senior program and like it has massively changed. And also there was no role models for me there. There was no female coaches. It was definitely, um, yeah. there were plenty of female coaches more than in Ireland, certainly. Um, there was no other Irish coaches. So again, being not British um, was a different yeah. experience as well. So there was a few, I mean, I definitely had, I had learned, I learned an awful lot. I learned an awful lot about performance and also, you know, it's tough. <laughs> I was going to ask though, if, 
and I guess this is somewhat of a, like a personal question for me, but it hopefully should be applicable to the people listening as well. But what kind of environment do you think would have held you within high performance coaching um, as a female coach? Because like, obviously this it's one of our biggest um, detriments it, when yeah. we look at gender balances at that level. And so um, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's the same in Britain, same here across all sports. It's not just a rowing Ireland thing. Across all sports, there is relative, so women, female coaches uh, are massively underrepresented. Um, and it comes back, and it's only stuff I've learned now that I recognize when I apply it back to my own thing. It was around um, the environment and the culture. I think that's a huge thing. And I also, and we'll probably touch on a little bit around inclusion, and, and that's not just bringing everyone in for happy, clappy times. It's actually about feeling. Um, feeling included and an inclusive environment is where actually you can feel comfortable and be yourself and I don't know that I always felt that um, and I think I spent an awful lot of energy trying to feel like I belonged and um, I, I think I well I ran out of energy is the truth yeah. <laughs> and also there was that was one element of it and there was also clearly I'd spent five years I'd been you know I didn't see any kind of where was I going to go next um, I didn't see anything in Britain at the time where I could break through, they weren't recruiting coaches for Caversham because again, only a small percentage of coaches will ever actually go through there. Um, I'd also done a master's in sports science. I had also been very involved in um, the programs that UK Sport ran around Talent ID and I was really fascinated around what they do with other sports. It was yeah. again like time around 2012. And I'd also met my now husband and I just thought this won't all fit and I just couldn't see a way through. So again, yeah. that's why I then kind of shifted a little bit. But um, back to the, the bit around the, the female coaches piece. Um, I don't think enough has gone into um, understanding um, women women, <laughs> and mm -hmm. women who coach. Um, so interesting, actually, I just saw today that Sport Ireland have released a survey around that and that's a really good yeah. start to baseline. There uh -huh. is a lot of programs. So there is a lot, if trying to increase women in high performance, I think you've got to, you, you can focus a lot on building the women and building the skills and building the performance and giving the opportunities, which is often overlooked. Um, but you, if you, you can keep doing that, but unless you change the system to which they're going to go into, it's not going to move. And yeah. I was reflecting on it because we're doing an awful lot of work with trying to engage underrepresented groups. And when we talk around talent inclusion, it's not just bringing more people in. It's actually yeah. those who have the ability and potential that they can, that we actually recognize what the barriers are so that they can't get over it. And it's very hard if you've never been in a position where you, have, you haven't had barriers. And a lot of our systems are set up in truth for male and male athletes and not always for females and not always from people from say Muslim backgrounds or black and minority ethnic communities who have different kind of, and, and you can't separate like the social piece around that. So again, with women, and also there's unconscious bias. We're all biased and there is in those systems. You don't have enough role models of people who are high performance and female. And I mean, again, that was a really hard moment for me to move away from that, but I just thought I can waste a lot of energy here or maybe my calling is in a bit of fixing the system bit that goes yeah. around it. Um, I, I think there is still a lot of work to do. I think um, the environment and like, if you're going to entice someone to effectively move to Cork, like if it, that was any other job, you would one want to make sure that you knew that you had a salary that was going to come in so you yeah. could get a mortgage and bring your family down. Um, and you know, coaching is a really hit and miss career. Like I was on one year contracts for ages, so never was going to get a mortgage on that one. Um, yeah your weekends are gone. I mean, one year I worked for 13 weekends in a row and I was like, I can't, you just don't have a life around that. Does it need to be like yeah. that? And a lot of the Brilliant. systems yeah. and structures are set up, but they can be changed. And so there's loads of opportunities, I think, if you start to actually understand who your audience is, understand the women and their lifestyles. Yeah. And you can't separate that from social expectation or again, the fact that particularly you know wanting to have children and um, that's a really important part and in truth I probably looked at Caversham and I saw no one's there they're never going to make any allowance for me um all the only way I could progress as a coach was to have athletes who who moved on again you know who won yeah. so had did I come a crap coach overnight because I didn't get people onto the next team in yeah. the way it was structured yes um but so it's it's a re-looking at what are the barriers the environment themselves, yeah. and the environment itself and you can definitely give the women the opportunity but 
solving the problem of women coaching is not just women it's about the environment and it's also then about the culture and that's driven by leadership as well so that yeah. there's and i we don't have a crack here by any means and it's only really i suppose a a dawning realization um, that you can keep doing as many women and coaching programs as till the cows come home but unless you actually change the structure and if you look where it works um if you look where it works people will feel like they belong they'll feel comfortable um, they'll be able to talk about things like childcare or going on maternity leave or the fact that they have to care for someone else or their husband's just got a job elsewhere and they can only do x amount of time if you create the environment where that conversation can have you're much more likely to retain people i think yeah. um so i think that's a big a big part and of it, it there's a question just came in there oh. um which is i think you're pretty much answering it is that how would you oh. suggest approaching a senior club member as a coach is how would you suggest approaching senior club members or coaches about women inclusiveness in a school club? So, um, I think I, what I, I will we save the inclusion bit for a minute? Do you want me to go on to that? <laughs> um, ooh, uh, yeah, let's go on to that. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I, it's it's about trying to understand who you're trying to gauge and then also understand the clips so we talk around inclusion and we got loads of people turn up going, how can you have inclusion and talent development and performance it doesn't make sense but actually we talk about inclusion in terms of people with the ability and potential and trying to remove the barriers for those people and creating an environment where it can be comfortable but in order to do that again we've had to the answer well why would we be more inclusive so principally it's talent pool and it's competitive advantage um, so you have, if you have an inclusive environment, you typically have a more diverse. Um, so you can, will typically have more people who have the potential to perform. Um, and then therefore you have the opportunity to um, kind of build that competitive advantage because you have different thinking, you've got different um, voices, different ways of doing things, different ways of solving problems. So again, the hook that we give to people as to why would we try and get more women in or why would we try and do this program is its performance advantage. Um, and you're increasing your talent pool and also if we think of the athlete going forward like social issues are really important for young people so they've got to be important for us too you can't like it's not going to be good enough to not include um, yeah. a greater diversity of people going forward but I'm, I'm happy to pick up that question as you'll notice I'm on my soapbox so I'm going to step up for a minute and I'll no, no, it's again. But, uh, <laughs> I think you're dead right and, and that's the whole point of diversity is just you're increasing the pool of people you can tap into and yeah. and and if you have more female coaches within the club um are included they again will bring in more diversity um in the athletes and who who they yeah. basically gravitate to when they're coaching as well the, the, so the, the hard thing is how and how you even start and, I, and we don't have the answer yeah. in that and that's exactly what we're exploring so yeah i can uh, happily share some thoughts on that in due course um so one of my other questions was um and it, again we're probably again talking about the same thing but if you were to put yourself back into an irish rowing club um what do you feel we need to do to nurture talent or put athletes on the best uh, development pathway so yeah, I, I was yeah we, um i was thinking about this um so it, it's often easy to think that more funding would help um, and I guess what I've seen across different sports who are very well funded and they don't do this well. Um, and I guess what I would say, I was trying to think back in my time in the Jazz and actually what were the, the real strengths we had was, and, and things that I probably didn't value because I didn't, because it was just there and I never thought around it. Um, but I would definitely value um, and put a lot of stock in the support and the community and the sense of belonging that you can give athletes. So the, the first thing is just keep them coming back like the simple thing and again that's free <laughs> um there's definitely around the coaching networks i think is really important again I'm, I'm you know i reflect it's probably i coached less as a team as a professional coach than i did as a volunteer coach if you like um i definitely think there's the whole engagement piece um and the the culture and the environment that you create around folk to have fun and even those who you spot who have potential they're still young people they're still developing we know that parents from a lot of research we've done are still a significant influence right the way through so we just done a whole piece of research with them um, a charity here called sports aid they give a lot of bursaries to athletes kind of up and coming and um, so they've been identified they've done really good competition results and still even those athletes who are kind of about to take the next step into world class programs here like so senior kind of olympic power programs 
um, would still cite their parents as the biggest influence. So, you know, you can engage with parents, you can, you know those kids, you know how they work, you know where they're from, uh, you know how to keep them motivated. Um, and like those actual things, particularly for a rowing, for a sport like rowing and Slater specialization, if you can just keep the, the, the kids in, they're progressing. And there's definitely clearly the task element of it. You know, there's the kind of the strength of conditioning. I mean, and, and that's where, you know, pooling resources and kind of working. I mean, if the only thing like an athlete learned was how to squat and do a, a press up as a rower, I think before they're 16, it would be happy days. Everything else builds on from that. But yeah, yeah. I you know, I kind of always think in terms of talent development and identification, there's always three factors intertwining. There's one, the tasks, so the rowing bit itself. There's the person and there's the environment. And there's definitely things that you can kind of pay for, particularly around the task side, maybe boats, S and C, things like that as well. But actually yeah. knowing the person and the environment we have seen has been massively undervalued. And actually, if you do not attend to that, those are the things that will fall away. You lose people. Then in your region, you won't have enough depth for competition or training groups. And then actually we see in, in, in Britain at the moment, a lot of the sports will have gone centralized, particularly for even for younger age stuff. And they've lost touch with the grassroots. So they've yeah. lost touch with the group that are coming in. So, you know, actually clubs are in a really powerful and strong position that um, just by knowing the people they're dealing with is, yeah. is I would suggest is a huge strength. I really wouldn't underestimate it or undervalue it. Um, you know, a lot of people get caught with winning medals and caught with trying to do kind of world championships and things like that as well. But actually the essence of it is you're giving someone huge life skills. Someone is like learning through sport and again I really you, you'll never predict who who is going to go on but what you can be assured of is that you're going to increase the likelihood of that person performing to the potential when they're older by giving them that real strong sense of belonging that real grounding in the club and the culture and you know a real comp that, that, that will kind of really engender real confidence in them uh, and they probably won't realize it at the time <laughs> but I think so for me that's that's the thing I'd really hold on to. And I think actually um, rowing in Ireland does that really well. There is a, a strong club network without yeah. that. And I wouldn't undervalue it. I think it, a lot of people, and I know myself, you get kind of carried away with winning the pots. Um, and clearly that is important and it's great fun. Uh, but it's been able to kind of separate that from the journey and yeah. without getting tried. But actually that's what people will take away. Um, you know, I have the pots there, but actually probably the most meaningful I have from that time coaching is I have a folder up on my shelf still there that all the girls put together and they wrote me all the letter. They mm. kind of included all stuff that we had done as a group. And I was like, that is probably one of the most meaningful things that I have. It even makes me emotional thinking about it. Yeah. Um, you know, and that, that sure. gave me massive confidence as a coach to actually, God, that's a huge privilege. Um, yeah, that's lovely. Have, that's so anyways. No. I'm spot on and it kind of um, echoes, echoes uh, what Larissa had said uh, in the last uh, mm. webinar that we did about the enjoyment and, and keeping kids involved is like most important early um, and again we got another question in uh, there today um, and again it does build on what you're just saying but uh, do you think that too intense junior high performance training programs can have effect on like the longevities of young athletes athletic career um yeah i think it is a balance because like a lot of athletes as well they they want to win like you know and mm. that's the fun side for them and especially the hyper competitive athletes so um yeah it is it's a tough one i think it comes back to again knowing the person and knowing what they can bear and also knowing what are you trying to do with them and what what are you trying to do together um again like uh in terms of yeah there's a huge thing there's a huge drop off between junior and senior huge drop off in all sports um, and actually what we're trying to better understand is like why is that is it because it's been so intense that they've the kids have been pushed into things and the expectations raised beyond their capability um, that they actually just don't enjoy it anymore so they're not going to come back um, so again you know there is definitely a, a huge balance and I think that's the craft or the art in coaching is balancing their expectations with their ability and yeah. your capacity to support them. Um, so again, and that that is a that's a coaching skill. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, you'll you'll only learn, unfortunately, by messing it up most of the time. <laughs> and then, or you know, but I'd be led by the athlete, and I think have the conversation, um, but also be really clear about what the training is trying to do and why you're doing that, and you know, what is being, like, what what is the 
um, what's the, the purpose of it, I suppose, yeah. is, is the clear thing. And I think if you're clear about that as a coach, you have a far better sense of sharing that with the athlete and being clear to them around what they're capable of or not. And then, you know, you've got to have the conversation with the parents to support them um, within that as well. So and, and or the school, if it takes training away and all those kind of things. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a it's a it's a balancing act. There's no way around it. And then uh, from your experience, again, back when you were rowing coaching, do you think, and maybe particularly in the UK, that they focus too much on the big erg results ahead of nourishing that kind of talented junior rower? Yeah, so it's funny, isn't it? It's, um, there's definitely a lot around erg scores and results. Um, as they say, ergs can float, um, which is true. Uh, they use that as a big indicator also because of the number of people doing it here. Yeah, um, yeah. So in one, so and the uh, we talk around talent ID. And we talk around the phases that there is in terms of understanding. So like we talked earlier, for me, there's a lot. Of, there's a different philosophy around selecting in, selecting out. Um, <clears throat> in rowing here, because of the breadth of people that would do it, they will use an erg score to select out people. So if you haven't hit the score, now not all there's wild cards, there's exceptions, but because of the scale um, here, they do that. Now other sports will do a select in and also at later stages and often particularly for underrepresented groups that might do a select in. And what I mean by that is you're using a score to cut out people or if you're selecting in, what criteria you're trying to, they're often, you're often selecting in on to see how someone adapts to a training or adapts to an environment. So actually you'll have a little bit more leeway around selecting in. Um, and I think that's, that's the key thing around the ERG scores. It's how they're used and what are you using them for? And what do they tell you about the progress of the athlete? Because if someone has a, a, a bad ERG score, like the last thing you want to be do, have them is disheartened, but also if they've never rode well before or, you know, so actually taking things into age, like chronological age, um, biological age indeed, um, and training head, headroom, like, you know, have they just taken up rowing this year or have they yeah. been on an erg for like seven years by the time they hit age 14? And of course you would expect them to have a good ergs work probably by then. So yeah. th there's loads of factors, but um, so I, again, that's, it's come back like, what, what are you trying to, what, what does an ergs score tell you? Um, what do you need to know about that erg score? Or, I mean, you might have someone who's really high potential because they might be tall, they might be actually really athletic. It might be the fact that they're also playing football and hockey and, you know, cycling, and they only can do rowing once or twice a week. But actually, you know, they might be six foot tall. So you'd probably hang in there and you'd know that the erg scores mightn't hit the junior thing. But actually, this is a long journey with them. Yeah. And, you know, therefore, you might make the decision that actually, I'm not going to push them on the erg because frankly, I just need them to stay in sport. Yeah. Um, I, so I think that senior level it, like it's it's an inevitable marker and you know you can't get away from it like you don't have a world champion that doesn't have a good or score but I think yeah at and that's level, a, you have that variation yeah. at like what you're saying. I, at junior level so many other factors to to take in I mean when you get into senior in university actually it's heading to be a career so it's no different in any other job you'd have some kind of key criteria you need to be able to do to do your job um, and that that's part of it um, and also they've done years of training they're you know you have much more goal setting they'll be looking much more longer term as well so it's kind of how you frame the erg score i mean if you can't hit the erg score we used to have that a lot of people you would think is high potential but they just weren't um phys physiologically appropriately suited to a strength endurance sport um, and they can yeah. never really hit the hit the erg scores down so um yeah it's 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 again understanding the context and yeah. what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go with that person there was another question that came in there. Um, so uh, from Jen, when you're talking about talent ID, you mentioned the environment of the club being very important. Mm. So can you elaborate on how specifically, or how that helps specifically in talent ID? So you've yeah. got, you've obviously identified your athletes. Now what's the ideal environment for those to nurture? Again, I think you probably have to. Yeah, I think you come back to principles here, um, Jen, in terms of, um, and it's also kind of, I suppose, as a coach, like, what do you actually believe around developing young people? Um, and this is why I hate the word talent, because it's like, um, so like, we're talking, yeah, so it's to set up the environment around the person. It's something that makes the person feel a sense of belonging, that you have created a good culture and kind of competitive environment around us. So there's enough challenge. And if you think of like what we understand around well-being, because actually that's what's going to see you through. And, and you can have definitely push people to do really good scores one season. But 
it's the sustainability of it is the key thing. So it's kind of keeping it balanced, giving people the opportunity to push through. I think it's also, you know, that there's a fun element to it. It's serious fun. Um, but again, it's kind of back to really human elements of what is a good environment. If you think of a, a time or a place where you may have had a really good teacher or a really good kind of um, class or a really good work environment, you know, what are the things there? And, you know, I think it comes back to the human interaction, the relationships. Again, we massively underestimate the value of relationships and again just in performance or whatever, maybe it's here <laughs> it's just like it doesn't mean you are impersonal and cold like you can actually have performance and have fun um, I mean Claire you would be testament to that in terms of the crew and the spirit that you get 100%, so yeah you know, I, think it's, actually, it's, I don't know if you're aware of it not, but the the girls now have a big uh, girls the girls basically Instagram group and it really does show the fun that that crew has it's, it's yeah. basically the heavyweight Irish team and um, it's yeah. brilliant because yeah they really bring an element of fun into yeah and around. I think that's it. I mean we talk about talent ID it's a program in a way of, it's really just recruitment it's, a, it's about I mean I always kind of think talent ID is the easy bit like the development is the bit that will take years yeah. and that's where the effort and almost that's no different to um, to coaching anyone else really in any other club environment um, albeit your expectations might be a bit different and, and the kind of this but and you have to hold that line because you are effectively you were kind of preparing them to be on a career that's the way we framed it so you would have how would you prepare anyone for work really um so it's, yeah. it's those you know there's the same kind of thing but again like i really wouldn't underestimate fun and support and they sound very namby pamby and soft but actually the research is coming through i've seen yeah. it time and again across environments um you know i really wouldn't underestimate that creating that sense of a market because that's what people will get comfortable not comfortable but they, they'll feel confident in and yeah. uh, connected to um, and I think it's really interesting observing over the years of like how the Irish athletes for example are doing and you know um, and the various um, coaching um, changes of coaches over the years and stuff as well but actually what's really coming through is a real strong sense of self and a sense of belonging yeah um, it's really palpable and cool to see um, yeah I think independent athletes as well. And that's always been kind of an Irish well, strength yes. as well. Um, and it is a strength. And it's often because think of people, oh, well, we can't afford to do X, Y, and Z. But having seen the opposite of where you have very dependent athletes, it's, you know, they're, it, it's not, I don't know that it's the most enjoyable environment environment to be in. And if you look at like someone, Sunita, who's like years and years in the program, it's very few athletes I see in Britain that have stayed the pace that long. Yeah. A lot of them yeah. come in, got the medal and go off. And, um, yeah. you know, and it just makes you think and reflect about that, the environment and, or, you know, you, you can put yeah. your life on hold for ages, but I think there's a difference here where people see it as a career in their life rather than a thing yeah. they do. Um, and I think if you're trying to look at a sustainable, successful program, you've got to think long-term like that. Um, and do you think um, maybe in any of the research that you've commissioned, but how we develop athletes, um, should be tailored whether they're male or female or do you think kind of oh I'm glad you asked me this question <laughs> this question always annoyed me <clears throat> because okay. I was like everyone would go oh yeah they are so different I was like no they're not but actually I did think so I'm going to give you three no's and a yes to this question okay. <laughs> because it okay. made me actually think about the difference between male and female because it's actually really part in question because I only ever coached female and athletes initially until I got the senior team and then I had a real sense of oh my god they're not going to take me seriously because I'm a female coach and they don't really know. And it was like real, like it was daft, but it was a real feeling. And I had it again when I kind of moved and ran programs that involve male athletes. And I re like, as I went on with them, I realized they don't care. They just want to know, can you help them make that boat go faster? And actually yeah. the real issues with male or females in the, the challenges I've had over the years more to do with the clubs and the, the leadership people. But that's a whole other bottle of wine. But in terms <laughs> of the, um, the athletes themselves, so, um there's no difference for me whether male or female in terms of my coaching philosophy because that always for me was around giving people the opportunity to perform to their potential and that is still kind of my core philosophy around what you want to do and how you do it either through coaching or through kind of leading teams or through kind of the system stuff i'm doing now um i don't think there's any difference in terms of the principles i have around development and like what we understand around developing people there's there's no difference to that again in terms of the empathy in terms of the goal setting the learning the kind of how you put together a season the periodization all those kind of things again for me there's no difference whether it's male or female there's no difference in terms of my expectations of them of what they can achieve 
Um, I think, again, so, sometimes societally, and there's a get, often a bit of bias in terms of the, like female performance isn't the same as male, but I'm glad to see that is going. I think even the fact that Olympics are finally like the gender equal, and also yeah. a gold medal is a gold medal. So it's interesting how that kind of, um, you know, that's a good thing for once that actually, like, it's valued the same. Um, there's still a bit of way to go, I think, probably with some clubs and things. But um, And I guess where I would treat them differently, and it's less because they're male and female, it's because they're individuals, and actually my approach to individually coaching them. So definitely with female athletes, they are different physiology. We know things like menstrual cycle, for, excuse me, will really make an impact. We know strength training has different, um, yeah. will, will work differently for females. Um, again, the hormonal hormonal fluctuations things like that as well we can't separate that there uh, will grow up in a world where you know princesses and things like that exist there's far more role models like the things like the 2020 campaign i was like does my heart good having been the mother of a three-year-old girl now um moana bring her on um so but we can't you can't separate that so i think um my approach to them and the same with males again there's expectations around them boys don't cry you know yeah. my vainest athlete was a male and my most relentless, uh, tough as males athlete was a female. So, I mean, I actually make less of a case about males and females and far more around just the individuals that you work with. Now, again, I had the luxury of coaching individuals, but even when I worked with cruise men and female, again, I would kind of come to thinking, oh my God, they will like want be huge, hard as nails, but actually that they will listen if and and if you again kind of you know if you have sound things to say and a good coaching approach and a good philosophy and consistency about what you do you, you know it, it won't be any different so um it, that goes there back is to some differences but not in necessarily my approach to them on three or four kind of core levels but how i actually would deal with them as people would differ um, and that goes back to that quote that you've had from the book um, and mm. that you're coaching the person and uh, yeah you know, and but it took me a while to even overcome my own biases yeah. of that to realize oh god these lads and sometimes they just need to make hope like it's like it's almost a relief for them sometimes i think not to have to be performing and the kind of the motto thing now yeah i've had different issues with male coaches and and like you know sat as the only female in the room with a whole bunch of men coaches having a good banter session and muggins over here on her own and that's but that's when i come around the culture and environment piece yeah um, but yeah actually the athletes i've never had an issue and actually it's been more my own issue rather than theirs yeah. um so yeah. yeah yeah there's a really um uh, there's two last questions mm -hmm. there's one i'll actually might finish with um i don't know if you're able to see them at the same time not. um so i'll go for the one that just came in but mm. Uh, did you and your athletes always feel supported? Unfortunately, in some cases, the coaches of juniors mm. do their best to support the junior and create a positive environment, but this isn't the case for the club establishment, as they don't see juniors worth the effort mm. if they are going to leave and go to uni. Oh, interesting. I would yeah. almost, I would feel that from my experience, that's not the case, that there's so much weight on uh, junior championships and and junior competition so um but uh. yeah it's true but it also comes back to what the what is the belief around what the club is trying to do is it to row or is it to develop young people through life and if you're thinking actually young people and all the great experiences that you're giving them like the travel the support the excitement the friends the discos all those yeah. kind of things that we actually and again if, if a club would only put an output on pots um then that other stuff is really hard to reconcile. And it's really interesting. We're doing this on a macro scale. You know, how do we tell the British government that it's worth putting 100 million into talent pathways? We might have only 60,000 athletes of a population of 50,000 and only about 1,500 move in to senior programs every year. So you're like, if you looked at cost per person, given all the other things that sporting have to do. So we cannot make the case that it's about athlete, you know, about medals. We only know maybe five to 10%, if you're lucky, of all programs will move it through. But so you have to make the strong case around for the value that the rest of those kids are getting from being involved in that program. And there's life skills. And again, this is some of the research we've been doing at the moment is to try and pull out that and, and be able to kind of articulate a far stronger story around the value they get being on being part of a program. And, you know, when you think that most of us here have all come through junior programs. So they'll be your future coaches. They could be your future officials. They could be the, the, the woman or the man who goes on and, 
goes to the city and earns a million pounds and then starts buying your boats again yeah so, you know it's a, all those kind of things so. definitely so much of as that. Claire would know from Cambridge <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so I am um, we ran out of time now so I had more questions but um I do have one more that came in from Heidi uh and I think so for when you return to Ireland and you set up your own rowing club um, and you're going to write your mission statement for this club, what would it be? But Heidi might borrow it for Truly Rowing Club in the meantime. Oh, Heidi, you know, Mary then. I wrote it, Mary, for years. There you go. There's another really good point of rowing and all the friends you meet for life. Um, oh, good one. Damn. Um, yeah, like no, my sorry. mission is basically, do you know what? It's It's come back over the years and I'd say I have kind of it's taken many years to figure out and reflect on actually what is what are we actually trying to do here um and i think really it's, it's like it's almost a, a i'm going to say a life through sport which sounds really kind of a bit trite but it's actually giving people the opportunity to perform to their best and um, if you can write that up in nice english you're welcome to it <laughs> yeah that's that's lovely thank you so much nasa um i think i've learned as much today as i did back in 2007 when you were oh, my coach for the coupe <laughs> de la Genève. Um, in Varese, so uh, NASA started me on my high performance journey. So yeah, very, God. very touching to be able to um to chat to you tonight. Oh, and bravo, you two! Yeah, I followed, I followed your progress, yeah. so it's wonderful to see you are the role <laughs> model, my dear. <laughs> Not at all. And um, there have might have been another mm. one or two messages or questions that uh, I've missed, but I might. Mm and the Monty uh, yeah I'm, I'm happy if it, more. drop a few questions and I'm happy and also some of the stuff around inclusion because actually it's a really it's a big yeah. thing we're working on and we actually think it'll shift things is um if you go to the talent plan for England I co kind of authored that and a lot of our ideas and principles around development are all in that so it's all free just downloadable from the web just if you like I've shared, talent that. Plan. Oh, I've shared that with the network but what I haven't shared yeah. is your email address would you mind oh please do yeah of course uh, yeah, yeah. and then um, please do. I'm going to encourage you to follow up with, with NASA, um, a wealth of information and you can only Worth touch on know. it in an hour. So um, thank you very much, everybody, this evening. And um, you also, uh, actually, just before I finish, uh, Sport Ireland have released a, a survey for female coaches and I'm going to send that around tomorrow. Um, but I'm going to encourage you all to fill it out because only when we know what the challenges are and uh, the current situation on the ground, is when we can actually do things to change it. So thank you very much. Um, thanks, Nessa. My pleasure. Thank you, Claire. <laughs>